Verse 5, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So before we get started, I want to call out the elephant that's in the room. And it's a, it's a pretty big elephant, and, and that is, look back at verse 5, Paul says, slaves, you are to obey your masters. So, question, is Paul saying that slavery is okay? And if, and if that's not what he's saying, then why doesn't he just tell masters, hey, uh, sl- set your slaves free? Or why doesn't he tell slaves Instead of submit to your masters, why doesn't he say rebel against your masters or fight back against the Roman Empire? And these are verses I've wrestled with. Uh, These are verses many, many people wrestle with because it raises a ton of questions. And as many of us know, um, these are verses that sometimes people will point to and they'll say the Bible's outdated, it's bigoted, uh, we shouldn't listen to it, and sometimes use verses like these as an excuse not to believe in God. So I want to tackle that first before we get into this issue of vocation. And that is, how how do we respond to this? And I did just want to plant a seed real quick. In a couple months' time, we're going to do a whole Sunday teaching just on the weird passages of Scripture. Uh, So what do you do when you come across those parts? You're like, ah, that's so weird, or it it, it doesn't make sense, or culturally there's a gap or whatever. So I want to unpack that more in a couple months' time. Uh, But for today, I want to just give you a couple facts that are so important when we read passages like these, which understandably make us feel really, really uncomfortable. Um, The first point that we need to know, and this is huge, is that, God is not pro-slavery. And we see this from the very beginning in Genesis 1, verse 27. All people, male, female, are made in the image of God. Um, You go to the book of Exodus, God declares war on slavery. The whole book of Exodus is God taking a group of people who are slaves and setting them free. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, um, Paul actually encourages slaves to gain their freedom. And in Galatians 3, verse 28, one of the most important parts of the New Testament, Paul says, in Jesus, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free, <laughs> because you are all one in Jesus. Uh, Romans chapter 6, we, a- we actually sang it this morning. Uh, it says, we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're now children of God. So we, we see all throughout uh, Scripture, God is not a God who is for slavery. In fact, the early church, they got that. And that is why when you study church history, they treated slaves as equals. Uh, Christians would pool their money in order to set slaves free. Um, we know that slaves played a key role in the early church. In fact, um, Ignatius, he was a second century theologian. He tells us that uh, a guy named Onesimus, who some scholars think is the same Onesimus in Philemon, that he would become the pastor of Ephesus. So Ignatius says that a slave became the pastor of this church. So we're reading Ephesians written to the church at Ephesus, led by, later on, a slave. So that's the first important point. Number two, slavery was different in the first century. Now, When you read a verse like, slaves obey your masters, our minds immediately race to the the tragedy, the the horrific things that happened in the 17th and 18th century America. Uh, We think of the cruelty and injustice. Um, We think today of, of race issues and tension and latent racism that is still there in our nation. And so obviously we're gonna have all kinds of walls that go up when we read, slaves obey your masters. But this is what we need to know. Paul's writing in the first century, a different time, a different culture. And in the Roman Empire, one third of the population were slaves. 
It was a different form of slavery though. Um, some uh, theologians, historians say it's, the word slave is wrong. It should be more household servant. Slavery wasn't based on race. So we think of slavery based on race. That wasn't the case back then. It wasn't for a lifetime. It was about 10 to 15 years. Um, in fact, many people would choose slavery to pay off a debt. So we have credit cards, we have Visa, MasterCard. That's how we pay off our debts or get in more debt. Back then, if you're in debt, they would sell themselves. Okay, I owe you this much money, I'll be your slave for 10 years and then we'll call it good. Um, slaves in the first century had civil rights. Uh, they could own property. Slaves, in many cases, owned other slaves. And this was really fascinating to me to find out that um, many slaves were highly educated. Accountants were slaves. Now, maybe you're an accountant today, you feel like a slave. Um, <laughs> doctors were slaves too. So if you were rich, you would have enough money to have your own personal physician and they were considered a slave. Now, of course, there's a dark side to all of this. And if you look prior to the first century, um, a couple hundred years prior to this, meant a lot of darkness happened around the slavery issue in Rome. And it was still dark in the first century. But the point being is that this is a very different term from how we think of it today. At its core, what Paul is talking about is really economics. He's talking about working for someone. And I think that's how we can interpret it today. In Ephesians 6, for us in 2017. This is Paul talking into our life today about vocation. He's saying when we work, we're to work in such a way that honors God. We're to honor our master, or you could just put your boss or company or whatever. And if you're an employee or employer, you're to treat those who work for you well with gentleness and respect and love. And, and this is now where this passage speaks to us because we all can relate to this. Did you know we spend a third of our life working? Um, the average American will spend 100,000 hours of their life at work. And I think for the most part, if we were to take a poll today, um, we tend to look at work as kind of a necessary evil, right? Business Insider, uh, you can Google it, have a fascinating article. And they were talking about how the majority of Americans hate their work. In fact, 80%, 80% of Americans are dissatisfied with their jobs. 40% of Americans say their job is, quote, either very stressful or extremely stressful. 13 million Americans take time off work every year because of stress. Now, if you don't know what stress is, it's when you wake up screaming and you realize you haven't fallen asleep yet, right? <laughs> it's that feeling of everything just crashing down around you. And that's how many of us feel about work. And I think one reason for the stress um, is one, we can't disconnect. Uh, there was a day when you could go to work, leave your work, come home, and you wouldn't do anything because you couldn't physically. Now, we carry our work with us. It's called our iPhones. And 59% of Americans check their work email on vacation. So that includes Christmas and, and other holidays. So we can't disconnect, that increases stress. Secondly, um, I don't think we feel competent enough. I, I know many of us, we maybe feel the pressure from your boss or whatever. And it's been said that to err is human. Um, to blame it on someone else shows uh, management potential. Um, <laughs> but we all err, right? We all, we all mess up, and, and, and so we feel that pressure. And then thirdly, of course, we feel overworked. ABC News just had an article on this. They said that Americans now work longer, more hours than any other nation on earth. Um, a close second to this is Japan. And in Japan, uh, it's not uncommon for people to work 70 to 80 hours per week. And this blew my mind, some articles on this. Um, people in Japan are literally dying from overwork. Um, 2,000 people last year died from overwork. So this is where you're sitting at your desk, responding to an email, and, and you just die because you've been there for way too long. Now, some of us would like that, actually. Um, um, they have a word for it. It's called karishimo. 
or, or karasho, which means overwork death in Japan. So this is, a, this is an epidemic in Japan, in our own nation. We feel stressed, we feel undervalued, we feel overworked. So the question I think we have to wrestle with is, as followers of Jesus, how do we follow Jesus in our workplace? Um, what, what does it mean for us if you're an employee to serve our companies with integrity? Uh, what does it mean if you're an employer to love and care for your employees? How do we find joy in our work? How do we find meaning in our work? And I wanna focus in today especially on this idea of meaning. And what does the Bible have to say about work? So we're gonna go on a journey um, through scripture. And I wanna start in the book of Genesis. So if, if you wanna turn there with me to Genesis chapter one, the very first verse of the Bible. And the Bible begins with a God who works. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, for those of you taking notes, the word create here um, in the Hebrew is the word bara. Um, let me hear you say bara. bara. It means to shape or to craft something. It means to work with excellence or with passion. So in Genesis 1, we have a God, like a poet, like an artist, who's pouring himself into his creation with excellence. Um, if you keep reading the chapter, God keeps on creating birds and fish, plants, flowers, mountain, lakes, the moon, the stars. And when God was done creating, when he was done with his work, he stepped back from his work and he said three words. What are those three words? It is good. It is good. God looked at his work and he said, it is good. The very first thing that the Bible says about your work <laughs> is that it is good. Another way of looking at it, it is sacred, it is holy, it is saturated with meaning. So if you're a barista today, it is good. <laughs> if you're a carpenter or a mechanic, it is good. If you're a teacher, an accountant, it is good. If you're a stay-at-home mom, it is good. I know that we don't always see it that way. Um, we live in a culture that tends to see vocation in terms of hierarchy. Um, just look at some of the words that we use. She got a promotion. He got a raise. She is climbing the ladder, right? We, we use this hierarchical language to describe work. Now, what, what does hierarchical language do? What it implies is that some work is really, really good <laughs> and more important, whereas other work is, is less significant. It's less important. Um, I, I think Christians, we, we can do the same thing. Um, we sometimes tend to consider work that is, quote, good, as work that is done for, say, a nonprofit or a humanitarian organization or a church. Um, sometimes we'll use the word ministry to describe people who are paid by the church and that is their vocation. Um, this happens all the time. I'll sit down with people and they'll say, you know, Dom, um, I wish that I could be in the ministry. Uh, this happened last week, actually. And, and I'll, I'll ask them, okay, uh, what do you do? Well, I'm a psychologist. I'm a banker, I'm an accountant, I'm a teacher. And, and I always go back to Corinthians where Paul says, we are all in the ministry. That if you are an accountant, that is your ministry. If you are a stay-at-home mom, that is your ministry. If you are a barista, that's your ministry for now. That's what God is having you to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are in the ministry. And we have to push back on this idea that ministry is just for a few paid professionals or ministry is for people who get up on a stage on Sunday. No, if you're a, a Jesus follower today, you're, you're in the ministry. Martin Luther is exceptionally helpful when it comes to this. Um, Martin Luther lived in the 1500s. He lived in a time when the institutionalized church had a massive hierarchy between those who were, quote, in the ministry and everyone else. Um, a huge, sacred, secular divide. And what you find in medieval Christianity, sad to say, is that the church giving this idea that if you wanna be in ministry, you have to work in the church. This is holy, and everything else is, quote, secular. 
Now, Martin Luther, this German theologian, brilliant guy, leader of the Reformation, he pushed back on this idea, and he's like, wait a minute. I guess he's German, so he's like, ein Minuten bitte, right? And, <laughs> and he says, no, no, we're all in the priesthood. Have you heard that phrase? The priesthood of all believers. Uh, you're all in the ministry. We are all part of, of what God is wanting to do to shape and transform and renew the world. And Martin Luther has this great quote. Um, he says, what else is all our work? Let's put it on the, yeah. What else is our work? Whether in the fields or in the garden, in the city, in the house, in war, or in government. These are the masks of God, behind which he wants to remain concealed and to do all things. Now, that's one of my favorite lines. These are the masks of God. Your profession, whatever you do, it's the mask of God. Or you could put it this way, it's God in disguise. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, in, in our hallway there, our foyer, we have the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. We pray that, but question, who actually gives us our bread? Well, farmers and truck dri drivers and retailers and Whole Foods, right? That's where we get our bread from. Or we pray, God, protect our city or protect our nation. Well, who, who's actually protecting our nation? It's police officers, it's women and men in uniform, it's the armed forces. So we're praying for protection, we're praying for provision, but in reality, what, what has God done? He's hired people to do the job. Now, God could have done it himself. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if he had angels standing guard around our city to protect it? That, that would be awesome. But he doesn't do it that way. Instead, he says, I'm gonna use a baker. I'm gonna use the retailer. I'm gonna use that truck driver. They're gonna be my hands and feet. <laughs> They're gonna be my fingers. It's God in disguise. Your vocation is the mask of God. God is using you to serve the world. So the Bible begins, the very first verse is a God who's working and his work was good. Now, let's turn the page uh, to chapter two, verse 15. It says the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now here's another word, so important. Um, God put the man in the garden, later on Eve as well, to work it. The word work is abad. And abad means cultivate, nurture. And this is fascinating. It can be translated as minister. <laughs> so maybe you're a gardener. My, my wife loves to garden. You're in the ministry. You're, you're serving the earth. You're cultivating beauty. Genesis 1.1, God is a creator. God is a craftsman. Genesis 2.15, you are a creator. You are a craftsman. You were created to create. That's why I'm so excited, Brooke making the announcement about uh, calling all volunteers who wanna help in our creative department. It's an opportunity for photographers and videographers and poets and artists to, to gather together and dream together and advance the mission of God. We were all created to create. Ephesians 2, we saw this a few weeks ago. We are God's handiwork. Literally, it's the word poem. You're God's poem. You're created in Jesus, why? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God made you with a drive, with a passion, with dreams and visions, a budget, resources, ideas. When you work, you are fulfilling the purpose for which you are made. And, and I know we don't always feel that way. I think of Moses. Moses had a dream to set slaves free. But you know the story. Moses spent 40 years as a shepherd in the wilderness. I was in Israel a few years back. I actually met a shepherd and he told me it's one of the most boring jobs imaginable. <laughs> and there's Moses for 40 years, a huge dream. I mean, it couldn't get any bigger. I wanna go to Egypt and I wanna tell Pharaoh to set the people free. That's, that's a massive dream. But what is he doing? What's the reality? Every day, he's with the sheep in the desert for 40 years. This wasn't like a six-month part-time intern thing. 40 years he's doing it. 
Could you imagine how frustrated he must have been? Could you imagine the days where he shows up at work? And I know many of you, you can relate to this. You're like, what am I doing here? This isn't where I want to be. I'm so sick of this sheep drama, right? That's Moses. Until one day, what happened? Moses saw a bush that was on fire. Now, that happens all the time in Israel in the desert, which tells us how boring his job was because he's all excited. Whoa, a bush is on fire. I'll go check it out. It's like the equivalent of Bob in accounting got a haircut. That's different, right? <laughs> so he, he goes over and he looks at this bush and then he's, oh, the bush, it, it's burning, but it's not burning up. And then even more peculiar, the bush speaks. That's when you know you've been at the same job for too long. <laughs> Bushes start speaking to you. And it's God. And what does he say? Take off your sandals because where you're standing is holy ground. Now, this is, this is what hit me. Where is he standing? At work. That was the ground that he had walked on for 40 years. That was the place he had led the sheep. That was his nine to five. And, and in Moses' mind, he's like, I don't want to be here. I hate this job. There are things I want to do. I have all these dreams and visions. And God's like, no, no, where you're standing, Moses, is holy ground. And, and what a difference it would make in our workplace if tomorrow when you show up at work, instead of looking at it, ah, I hate these sheep, <laughs> instead, you know what? This is holy ground. This is where God has me. What if the place where God has you right now is an opportunity for you to encounter him in a fresh and beautiful way? Your work is sacred. It is sacred space. It is holy ground. It's not just a job. It is a call from God. In fact, did you know the word vocation uh, comes from the Latin word vocare? And it means calling. Just think of calling. What's a calling? It's when someone outside of yourself invites you into a larger story. That, that's what God has done for you. Your work is a call from God. Now, you might be at your current work for five years. You might be there for another month. It might be a lifelong thing. You may not like your job. Uh, you may have a boss that reminds you of Kylo Ren, right? There may be all kinds of issues with your work. But here's the good news. Don't miss this. At the end of the day, you're working not for your boss or that company. You're working for God. He is your boss. He is the one you're serving. He is the one that you're accountable to. When I see it that way, it is so liberating. It's so freeing. Work is, is less than of an obstacle and it's more an opportunity. It gives it life and purpose and meaning. Um, Jeff Goins, he said, we are caretakers of our vocation stewards entrusted with a vision that is bigger than us. Our responsibility is not to hoard our gifts, but to use them in challenging ways so that others can benefit. In short, your calling is a gift, one that is intended to be given away. Calling is a conduit for life, allowing us to bring our skills and our passions together in a satisfying and meaningful way. And I just love that line. He says, your, your vocation, it's a conduit for life, for your skills, for your passion. I think that is what Paul is getting at in Ephesians chapter six, when he says that when we work, we're to do it with all our heart, wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord. So he says, look past your master Understand you have a father who's in heaven. He's your boss. Um, Colossians 3, verse 23. This is so worth writing down. Uh, Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Work with all your heart, he says. And here's the paradox, because ABC News, we work longer hours than ever before, but here's the paradox. We're less productive than ever before. And tons of studies have been done on this, how more and more uh, we tend to cut corners, show up late, leave early, take uber long lunches or whatever, surf the internet when we should be working. And this is the mystery is that we quote, work longer, but we're less 
productive. And many managers are, are feeling this. If you're a manager, I'm sure you can relate to some of this. Like you wanna see more productivity out of those who are working for the organization. In fact, one, one massive company, they get thousands of applicants every month. And some of the applications are so sloppy that they receive that they actually decided to post a few of these online. And, and it's classic. Some of the things that people say. So you know when you fill out a job application, it'll say reasons for leaving the last job. These are actual responses. One person put, responsibility makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> here's another they insisted that all employees get to work by 8.45 every morning and I couldn't work under those conditions. <laughs> oh my gosh. Now here's another. I procrastinate, especially when the task is unpleasant. <laughs> and, and I love this one. The company made me a scapegoat, just like my three previous employers. <laughs> and then you know how they'll, they'll have part like marital status or whatever. So someone put marital status often. Children, they put various. <laughs> and then this is the, I love this line. At the bottom, you have your notes, whatever you can put in. They put, please call me after 5.30 <laughs> because I am self-employed and my employer does not know I am looking for another job. <laughs> now that's a slow burn for some of you. <laughs> so we live in a time, and, and if you're a manager, you know this feeling where, ah, more than anything else, you want people who are on the team, Right? Like, that's how I feel as a pastor here. I, I want a staff that's passionate and engaged and on the team. You can relate to that. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, when you work, do it with all of your heart. Passion, energy, focus, joy. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if if Portland was filled with Christians who were the hardest workers, if Portland was filled with Christians who gave it their all, what a, what a witness there, that would be. And you look at scripture, sure, scripture has broken, messed up people. But one thing they all had in common is they all knew how to work hard. Adam and Eve, they were gardeners, right? They, they're caring for the earth. Uh, Joseph, he was a politician. David was a soldier. Uh, Jesus was a carpenter. Peter was a fisherman. Uh, Matthew worked for the IRS, right? Um, Paul was a tent maker. So you find all these different careers and vocations, but one thing that united them is they did it with excellence. So, so question, what does it mean to do your work with excellence? Maybe, maybe you're an artist, maybe you're a banker, maybe you're a barista, maybe you're uh, a dentist or a programmer or an engineer. What, what does it mean to do your job with all your heart? Simply this, do it well. <laughs> Work with passion, creativity. Strive for mastery. What does it mean to be a Christian accountant? Work hard for your client. Be thorough, have integrity. What does it mean to be a Christian designer? Listen, understand, create beautiful things. What does it mean to be a Christian teacher? I met with one last week. What does it mean? It means teach well inspire a love of learning in the hearts of your students. A guy recently asked me, he's a, a pilot for United. What does it mean to be a quote, Christian pilot? And my response is, well, land the plane, right? <laughs> That's all we ask. That's all we ask. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian lawyer? Repent. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, <laughs> A couple of days ago, I, I texted a friend and um, he works uh, for the Blazers. And I just asked him that question. Hey, what does it mean to be a Christian athlete? What does it mean to be in the NBA and all that stuff? And, and he texted me back. and I, I just love his response. He said, to model Jesus to the world. <laughs> Such a good answer. Because that's what we're called to do. What, whatever your, vaca or your vocation is, and vacation, that would be nice too. But whatever it is you're called to do, Model Jesus, work hard. C.S. Lewis, he said, what we want is not more little books about Christianity, but more little books by Christians on other subjects with their Christianity latent. In other words, the world needs not more Christian fill in the blank. 
What it needs is more Christians who do good stuff, who make good art, who create well, who are filled with integrity. What if God cares more about not where you work, but how you work? What if the greatest message that we could give to our city is not our words, but, but our work? And what if the best way that we can make Jesus beautiful to others is by doing what we do Monday through Friday with all of our heart. When you live this way, when you see God as your boss, when you're serving him with all your heart, work, I guarantee, becomes way more meaningful. Life becomes more meaningful. And the icing on the cake, Paul says, you'll actually be rewarded for what you have done. I mean, in our text, he says, you're gonna receive an inheritance from the Lord. Jesus, he said in Matthew, even if you give a cup of cold water to someone who's thirsty, you won't lose your reward. Maybe you're a barista and you're in the business of giving people cups of water and cups of coffee. There's a reward for you. Jesus says, you will be rewarded in heaven. You will receive an inheritance. And this for me is a game changer because let's face it, there are times when our work becomes it feels so detached from anything of eternal value, right? H have you ever been there and it's like endless meetings? Someone wrote a book recently called Death by Meeting. It's so true, <laughs> right? Endless meetings, thousands of emails, um, hours stuck in front of a computer. You're stuck in traffic on the commute. And it's easy to question, what's the point? <laughs> this seems so pointless. It seems without value. I mean, I think back to one of my first jobs. I, I've done different things. I've done construction and landscape. I was a teacher in, in Vienna. Um, but my, one of my very first jobs was in Lincoln City. I was in high school. And I, I spent the last two years of high school in Lincoln City. Now, I, I don't know what people call it now. But back then, um, there was a name that the locals gave Lincoln City. They called it Drinkin City. And um, for a good cause, everyone drank it. That was how they dealt with the rain and the depression. It seemed like everyone was depressed, and so everyone drinks. So my, my first job, senior in high school, was, uh, you know Price and Pride when you're on Highway 101? It's still there, Price and Pride. Okay, I worked at Price and Pride, and you know when you, you have those recycling cans, uh, soda or whatever, and you bring them into a place where you get money for them? I was the guy for four twenty five an hour who would take that bag of beer, mostly beer, and, and soda, and I'd bring it to the back of Price and Pride, and I had these, these gloves on and this, this apron, and open it up, and it was, it was the worst smell, seriously. <laughs> It, horrific. It was like this sick fermented mix of slugs and spit and tobacco. It was, hor I'm not kidding, it was horrible because these bags have been sitting outside in the Lincoln City rain for months, if not years. And so they bring them to me and it's like, oh. And I had to throw these different cans into their different companies so they'd come and pick them up. Your pastor knows way more about Miller Lite than, than you'd like to know. Um, <laughs> And I think that's why to this day, I don't like beer because that get, really gave me a bad taste, literally. Like it's, <laughs> I'm throwing it and beer would be landing all over me as I'm throwing. And I had to do it like a certain amount every hour. So I'm working really fast, beers flying everywhere. Now, granted, sure, it's for a good cause, right? And I, I used to tell people when people ask, you know, what is it that you do? And I'm like, well, I'm an environmental recycle specialist. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> But there were, there were times, I did that job for a year, and there were times I'm like, oh God, I felt like Job, right? Like why? It, it, it felt horrible. And see, this is where what Paul is saying and what Jesus is saying can be so liberating. Maybe, maybe you feel you have like a, a job like that. I actually met a guy at the 8 a.m. That's what he does for a living. And he's like, I can so relate to you right now. Jesus says, whatever you're doing, you're gonna be rewarded for that. You may not feel rewarded by your company, you may not feel rewarded by your boss, but your heavenly father will reward you. If there's no God, by the way, then really your job is pointless. <laughs> if there's no, no God, no matter what you do today, yeah, sure, it, it's a waste of time. If there is a God though, 
then it brings beauty and meaning and justice and passion to what you do. And that is what Paul is arguing for here because there are times when we feel discouraged. There are times I feel that way, even now as a pastor, Monday morning, I get a few angry emails. There are times it's like, ah, what am I doing? It can feel like a waste of time. And we have to keep this eternal perspective in mind. Question. Any Lord of the Rings fans in the house today? Okay, one of my favorite books, um, Lord of the Rings, so good. J.R.R. Tolkien, friend of C.S. Lewis. He lived, wrote in in Oxford, England. Um, When I lived there, uh, sometimes I'd go to the pub and and meet with uh, some friends there, other students, and we'd talk over theology in the same place where Lewis and Tolkien would meet. It was this epic place. And they would talk about literature and they'd talk about their works of art. There was a time when J.R.R. Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings, and if you've read it, you know how beautiful and complex it is. It was taking him way longer than he expected. Um, All these characters, Tolkien invented languages. He literally invented languages for that book. So it's taking him in all these different directions, taking years and years. And there was a time where Tolkien struggled with depression because he wondered, am I ever gonna get this done? I have this dream, I see where it wants to go, I just don't have enough time. Um, And on top of that, it was World War II, Tolkien got called into the military. And as at that time, he's really, really down, really struggling, just feeling disheartened. And this newspaper in Ireland, they asked him, hey Tolkien, could could you write for us just some, a work, an article, a fictional work? And he says, sure. And he writes this beautiful story for an Irish newspaper. He says, there once was a guy named Niggle. That was his name, Niggle. Which, by the way, if you're Irish, Niggle was another term back then for work. So it's kind of this parable. This guy named Niggle, he said, was an artist. And he had a dream where he wanted to paint this beautiful tree. He could see what the tree looked like. He could see its leaves and the way the roots went down and how majestic it was. Every day, Niggle would work on this tree, but every day something would happen and maybe a creative block or he'd feel frustrated or interruptions. Day after day, he had a dream, but day after day, it wasn't happening. And suddenly, tragically, Tolkien wrote, Niggle died. When they went in to gather his stuff, they found his picture and all he had painted was a single leaf. When he died, Tolkien said he was on a train heading into heaven. (laughs) He arrives in heaven. He gets off the train and he sees there this meadow, this beautiful meadow. And at the end of a meadow was an incredible majestic tree and something about it looked familiar he ran up to the tree and he realized it was his tree it was the one that he had dreamt about that was in his mind that he wanted to paint all those years but he didn't have the time to paint and there it was with its branches growing and the leaves dancing in the wind and tears came to his eyes as he realized he could only paint a leaf in this life but in the life to come, it was done. It was complete. And I know many of us, that's how we feel about our jobs. You have all these dreams and visions and passions and things you wanna do and places you wanna go, but we live in a broken world. And and life is hard and our job is hard. And sometimes it feels like all I'm doing is painting a leaf, but God's put in my heart a tree. (laughs) Uh, All I'm doing is punching these numbers in a computer, but I have a vision for so much more. Like Moses, you, you wanna see the slaves set free, but you're stuck with the sheep. And the good news is this, is that even if all we get done in this life is a leaf, because there's a God and because heaven is real, there is a tree and what we're doing now even if it seems small and insignificant it matters to God and it matters in eternity in the Lord your work your labor is not in 
vain. Some of us need to hear that today. Your work is not in vain. The theologian Reynold Niebuhr, he said, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. And there is hope. There is a tree on the other side. And there is meaning and there is purpose to what you do. I close with this. Tim Keller in that book, Every Good Endeavor, he said, whatever you're seeking in your work, the city of justice and peace, the world of brilliance and beauty, the story, the order, the healing, it is there. It's heaven. There is a God. There is a future healed world that he will bring about. And your work is showing it to others. Your work will be only partially successful on your best days in bringing that world about. But inevitably, the beauty, harmony, justice, comfort, joy, and community will come to fruition.